I'm starting a what I think is going to be a pretty long series of videos talking about the past of comics and specifically a lot of the decisions that were made in these different eras that impact us today. I think you're going to like these, but I want to lay out kind of some some basic concepts to you and why this set's going to kind of challenge our assumptions and and definitely take a couple leaps that I think you'll be interested in, but we're going to have to fill in some of the gaps together. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Um, I'm going to do a set of videos, like I talked about, talking about the history of comics and specifically about the decisions, good and bad, that really became key moments in comics. Now, I expect the series to be, eh, you know, not well loved. I, you know, I'm pretty clear at this point what gets the traffic and what doesn't. But hey, I'm still living in this world where I don't really care about the traffic, so <laughs> I do what I want. Um, I'm going to put this in a play playlist. But the the other factor is this, and it's kind of what I've been hitting on with some of the recent kind of videos on fans and opinions and other things. It's that um, everybody has their own opinions on comics. And a lot of those opinions are not formed by yourself. You, you obtain those opinions by listening to others or reading from others, or, you know, generally we form our opinions on everything, not just comics, from a wide variety of sources. And then we kind of patchwork them together, and that's what we believe about comics. Unfortunately, the thing that I think is true with comics is that decisions get made that are feel unrelated to kind of what would play out later in life, later in history, but they wind up being very impactful. Um, I'll give you an example. So in the mid-80s, you had you know folks like you had Frank Miller and John Byrne, Alan Moore as kind of iconic um, major creators. Everybody knew who they were. They would sell good comics. They were bankable names. And there was this, kind of always this dynamic between, you know, they were doing work for Marvel or DC. They, those, that wasn't the best place to do your work from as a creator because you were getting paid and, and nothing wrong with that. But there's always a feeling like at the end of the day, as a creative person, you're making works for other people. Something that was very much on Alan Moore's mind somewhat Frank Miller, but you definitely had this feeling of uh, comics is kind of a closed system. So while you can become famous, become popular, you're, you're, you're making money for someone else at the end of the day. Yourself too, but, but this was going on. And in, and in these kind of mid to late 80s, you had, I would say, a decent amount of angst from these individuals, people who were you know, they were playing the game and at times it was very a schizophrenic viewpoint where they were feeling like they were uh, highly regarded and, and they were by Marvel and DC and kind of the big publishers at the time, but also that uh, they were making other people rich. And this was one of the things that John Byrne and uh, Frank Miller would complain about Jim Shooter and folks like that about of that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what did a Jim Shooter do? You know, the real work, the real uh, draw to get people into the shop to buy the comics was coming from from them. And there's truth to that statement. I, I, the part that I think is going to generate the most amount of disagreement in these videos is that almost everything that's said has some element of truth. Uh, it's rarely all wrong. It's just that because of, of the little details and the nuances, this truth, you know, it can become pretty different. So, the point of the story is, is, is at, in the kind of mid to late 80s, these big names becoming uh, very iconic, very huge. And then you had some younger people coming coming into the field. And they were simultaneously wanting to kind of prove themselves into the craft. And they also were finding it difficult because, you know, some of the leadership at these big companies really didn't want another John Byrne, another Frank Miller, another Alan Moore. They didn't want to necessarily have some big superstar creator show up that then was going to be a headache to deal with. So there is an, there is an interesting dynamic playing here. And I think part of this um, is is very much you saw play out with, with two people in particular, Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee. And the two of them were coming into comics, certainly, and getting more and more popular. Uh, Todd McFarlane is coming in, and he's uh, becoming a star on, on Spider-Man, and he's he's becoming a pretty big name. I think his experience with Peter David on the Hulk was also pretty significant in how it would kind of tilt Todd's mind and, and change how he looked at comics. Um, but 
as you have these younger creators coming in. They want to be stars. They want to make that same kind of money. They want to be kind of seen in the same kind of light as the Frank Millers, Alan Moores, John Burns. Um, but you know, they're new comics as a just general industry had this, this pay your dues kind of mentality, very similar to wrestling where, you know, if you, if you try to get too big, too fast, the, you know, the, the older crowd would slap you down. And so there's this, how do I maneuver that? And then what was happening is that outside of comics, you're seeing kind of Batman come out and be huge with merchandising opportunities and all the, the, the places. Suddenly these comic properties were everywhere. And you saw kind of some of the independent stuff. You saw the Cerebus uh, getting very popular, you saw Ninja Turtles. You saw these other properties that are coming out and then going from zero to super popular in a much quicker amount of time. And this is the interesting thing to, to look at. It's a case where, you know, the old logic was you, you go to work for Marvel, you go to work for DC, you spend 10 years kind of building up your craft, you know, paying your dues, getting kind of to some level of establishment. And then maybe, maybe you are considered a bigger star and then you can, you have to continually kind of pay homage to kind of the company. And one of the things that I think Alan Moore always chafed at almost immediately uh, but Frank Miller and John Byrne played the game a lot more. So, um, uh, George Perez is another great name to add into this mix. Is while they were getting very popular, they also had to do a lot of things to kind of tip the hat back to the publisher. So as as kind of these younger creators coming up are seeing this, then they're also seeing things like uh, you know the the Ninja Turtles phenomenon, where these these people come out and they make a comic and it gets very popular very fast, and it it shortcuts to the same kind of Hollywood merchandise and and pop culture uh, phenomenon. You see the creators' names front and center. I mean, with Batman, you see DC Comics Batman. You don't see, you know, um, you know Bob Kane, Bill Fingers Batman, you know, or or Frank Miller's Batman. Even though they're they're taking beats from those stories, you're not seeing the creators. You're just seeing the property. So for Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and some of these guys, they, they're now getting more and more popular. They're starting to collect a following. And they come to the conclusion and decision point where they don't have to follow the rules. They can kind of skirt things. And in many cases, were very clever about how they were pointing out, look, there's all these kind of new comics coming out, the very late 80s, early 90s. Uh, it's a boom time. You know, the collector's market is really huge. You got a bunch of adults thinking that they were going to pay off their kids' colleges by comics alone. And so you have this, this riding wave, and you get people like Todd and like Jim Lee and others like Rob Liefeld and, and Mark Silvestri and, and Eric Larson. Uh, but, but mainly, it's, it's interesting to keep your eye on Todd and Jim because the two of them, I think, really uh, early on understood kind of this dynamic between hey, we've got toys, we've got movies, we've got shows, we've got, it's not just comics, it's all of these these pieces that we can kind of collect together and assemble to be pretty, pretty powerful. And so, you know, Tom McFarlane had a lot of, you know, consider for a moment, he's going up against uh, incumbents and, and people like, um, uh, like Peter David and others, and he's able to kind of vouch for his own comic, his own Spider-Man, just Spider-Man, and it comes out the gate, sells uh, close to two and a half million copies. And this was like a, a like a bomb went off in comics. It was it was ground shaking. You have somebody relatively quickly in their career being able to pull those kinds of numbers. And then that followed up by Jim Lee selling, what was it, like 8 million copies of X-Men number one. And that taught the industry multiple lessons like, hey, this is what variant covers can do. Or not variants, but this is what multiple covers can do. And this is what this kind of project took a look like. And, I mean, you're just talking about uh, an insane kind of ripple effect from these two pieces that then propel the two of them to have the confidence to kind of go off and, of course, start Image. And then we saw how Todd's career deviated from Jim's at that point and, and everything that went on there. But, and I'm, and by the way, uh, this is, this is meant to just be a, a beginning to kind of these, these bigger conversations about history. Uh, but when you look today in 2020, you see that some of these events, some of the ways that these creators um, kind of decided to, to 
buck the, the old system, the old way of how things were done, the established way of how things were done, how the publishers reacted, how the publishers vowed never to let this kind of situation happen again, where the leverage was swinging to the creator side rather than inside the company. And these, you, you see decisions made today that still reflect these actions. So that was just a not that quick example of what I'm going to be discussing. I want to go through comics in the 40s, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, you know, and and even some of the, what we fa- saw from kind of how how Bendis uh, changed writing at Marvel and, and other pieces, and look at these events and really in the context of how did these moments shape today? Because oftentimes. And this is when I argue about people in the comments below. A lot of this stuff has happened before in one form or another. It doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the stuff that's happening today isn't important, but it does mean that we can learn a little bit about where things are going, how to react to it, and how to uh, kind of manage our expectations of what's going to go on. And particularly if you're a creator who's in the business for 10 years or less, a roadmap of kind of how to steer your career and, and maybe some of the pitfalls to fall into and, and everything else. Because comics has a fascinating way of the same mistakes happening over and over and over and over. And, and why is that? But anyway, I hope you like this series. I'm interested for any questions. So that's why I wanted to start this way. Um, it'll, be, it'll be something new. And it's, it's, it's cool history stuff for me to talk about and go through, uh, there's there's a million videos with a lot of different takes on all this kind of stuff. What I want to try and do is present it as much as I can somewhat factually with some moments, and then you make the conclusions. But what I want to do is, is point out how these decisions from maybe 30 years ago reflect today. That's that's the point. So if you have any questions, any comments, please leave them below in the comment section. But I'm excited to talk about this topic, and we'll, we'll see where it all goes. And if you're listening to this and you're like, please no, let me know that too. But if you're excited about it, give me a shout out that you're excited about it. I'll make sure that, uh, oh, just give me encouragement to keep going, you know, have that fighting spirit. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, social media, following, email, comics with an S, perch at gmail.com. Yeah, thanks for listening.